One of my fondest and earliest memories is helping my grandpa in his garden. He grew the reddest, most delicious, plump Arkansas tomatoes. I used to spend hours in the summer helping him cultivate the literal fruits of his labor. Sometimes we'd take the right off the vine with a salt shaker in one hand and a tomato in the other and we'd eat them right there. Sometimes, you know, today if I run my fingers along the a green vine, that smell, that tomato vine smell, takes me back to Arkansas instantly. You know, my grandpa had a gift for gardening. He would spend hours out there cultivating. He would be preparing the soil in the spring and then as the seedlings went into ground, he'd be out there every day protecting them and nurturing them until finally we'd see the first fruits of his labor, little red spots in a sea of green vines. And this was an exciting time because we knew that pretty soon we were going to have bucketfuls of tomatoes, so many that we'd have to just be giving them away, sharing them with whoever we could find. You know, whether you're a gardener or not, I think if you think about your life like a gardener, you might have more impact on you and on the world than you would think. We've all been given gifts, and like plants, they have so much potential to bless us and bless others. But without cultivation, they wither and they die. So I want to give you the tools today to cultivate your gift, to prepare the soil for something good, and to protect those seedlings as they grow so they can produce fruit and you can share it with the world. I was trained as a photojournalist right here in UNC Chapel Hill. And when I finished my program, I went to work at a media outlet. And I came home one day after just a routine HR training to share with my wife about the day, how things had gone. There was a question that they had posed that was stuck in my mind. It was, is there something you feel like you should be doing that you haven't done yet? And for me, that was actually a pretty easy question because I wanted to move to South Africa and tell hopeful, redemptive stories with my camera. You see, I had done my thesis work here at Chapel Hill on AIDS, poverty, and faith, and exploring those themes through a township in South Africa. And I was determined to tell a different story about HIV than what you saw in the news at the time, which was all doom and gloom and death. See, I was convinced that there were helpers on the ground repairing the world around this issue of HIV. And I was determined to find them and to tell their stories, to inspire others to become part of repairing the world as well. And so that's what I did. And when I was done, I knew that those relationships that I'd formed in the township, they weren't over, but I just didn't know how they were going to carry forward until I relayed that question to my wife. And she said, let's do it. Let's move to South Africa. And so we quit our jobs and asked our friends and family to support us for a year. And we went on a plane back to the township. And it was during that year that we got to visit the neighboring country, Swaziland, which they now call Eswatini. And it was there that we met this lady, Robin Richter, and she told us her story. See, she was a mom caring for her children. And she noticed that there were some children down the street who were going hungry, and she didn't know what to do. She said, I'm just a housewife. What can I do? You see, at this time, more than 50% of the people in Swaziland were HIV positive. And they said that if something didn't happen quickly, within a few decades, the entire Swazi culture would go extinct. And so in this context, she decided to make peanut butter sandwiches for the children down the street. Well, one thing led to the next, and people started bringing her abandoned babies and she would nurture them back to health. 23 years later, whenever the police find a baby left in a hospital or thrown in a pit latrine, they bring them to Robin, and she nurses them back to life. Sometimes discovering your gift means following a hunch, even if it seems ridiculously small and kind of crazy. During that year, we got to meet so many people like Robin who were doing really amazing and inspiring things. And I decided that I wanted to make a business out of this. I wanted to come back to the U.S. and make a living telling hopeful and redemptive stories. And so we came back, but it was in the middle of the worst economic recession since the Great Depression. And to make matters worse, we were expecting our first child, which was a huge joy, but we didn't have any health insurance right away. And my wife actually had a job lined up before we got back, but when we got home, we realized that she was going to have to raise the salary for that job. And so we figured, if we can do something now, it'll only get better. And so I proceeded forward. I was hustling, trying to do whatever I could to earn money and to tell these redemptive stories. 
But every month, our savings account was taking a hit. We just weren't quite making it. Until finally, a hospital system came along. I wanted to tell stories on video every month about doctors doing interesting things outside of the hospital. And I said, that sounds like my kind of story, and it's a regular gig, so yes, I will do that. The only problem was I could count on one hand how many videos I had done to that date. I had just been taking still photos to that date. And so they let me do a test video, and they loved it. And I was on my way telling stories every month about doctors in rock bands or nurses flying in hot air balloons. And I was having a blast. Today, me and a team of storytellers, we get to work with some of the most inspiring people, helping them tell their stories on video. Let's talk about your gift. We've talked about mine. Let's share a little bit about how you can cultivate your gift. Well, the first step in cultivating your gift is preparing the soil. Okay, your soil is your life habits. These are the things that form the foundation for something good to grow. You know, my grandpa would be out there every spring preparing the field, taking out anything that had grown in there that didn't need to be there, and he would be tilling the rows. He'd bring in a piles and dump trucks of manure and spread it all around so that everything was ready. And when you saw that the rows, that those black dirt rows lined up, you could just sense that it was pregnant for life. What's your life like? Is it fertile soil for something to grow? Or is it overworked, tired, and stressed, and just barely keeping up? You know, that year before we moved to South Africa was one of the most stressful years of my life. In the course of six months, I started a new job. I finished grad school. I got married. My mom passed away. And then we moved houses three times. And it was just a couple weeks after my mom had passed, and I was driving into work. And as I pulled into my parking spot, I just started sobbing. I couldn't do it. I was having a nervous breakdown. Have any of you all felt like that before? Like, I just can't go on. Like, I have nothing left. You know what we need in this world of this is so busy? We need to slow down. Take time. You know, that year in South Africa forced me to slow down. This is me and my wife enjoying Kruger National Park, out in nature, getting in touch with ourselves. We had time to journal and reflect and get in touch with our emotions and let ourselves dream about what we wanted in the future. You know, slowing down isn't easy. It takes a lot of discipline. And you're going to have to say no to things that might seem good. And people are going to give you pushback about that. And just like any new habit, like exercising or eating right, you just start small and let yourself grow in the right direction over time. And as you've done that, then you've prepared the soil for something good to grow. And you put the seeds in the ground. And as those seeds grow, they form little seedlings. And it's a really exciting time. You see the first fruits of what you've been doing coming to life. But it's also fragile time. You need to protect these seedlings because weeds could come along and choke them out. And they need nurturing every day so that they can continue to grow and thrive. During this stage, my grandpa would be out in his garden every day, pulling weeds, watering them, giving them everything that they needed, these little babies that he had raised up. What are the things that threaten your gift? For me, it's fear. Fear of the unknown, fear of failure, fear of inadequacy. But what is fear? It, it starts in our minds. And what is in our minds from day to day? What are the thoughts that occupy us? Well, if you're like me, then from the time you wake up in the morning to the time you go to bed at night, you're bombarded with messages from everywhere. Emails, social media, advertisements, billboards. You might have coworkers complaining or friends constantly complaining about the world. And a lot of times these sources can give you negative messages. And when they go into your mind and you let them sit there, they're like weeds and they can choke out your seedling. So you need to treat them like weeds and pull them by the root and throw them in the pile where they need to be burned. And we need to be vigilant about guarding what goes into your mind because our brains are actually biased towards negativity. That means that for every one negative thought, you need more than one positive thought to counteract that. You know, my grandpa, his tomatoes were legendary in our family but they also had a huge meaning to the community. You see, every week or so, we would load up big buckets full of tomatoes in the back of his pickup truck, and we'd drive into the city where we'd visit a home for battered women. And as we pulled into the driveway, the cook would come running out, give my grandpa a big hug, 
And she started telling him about all the things she had cooked with the tomatoes that he brought last time. And it was such a joyous moment. All the way back, back to the country, I'd look up at my grandpa in the truck, and he'd just be smiling, big grin, and singing. It gave him such joy to share his gift with others. Now, I want to pose that same question to you that took my wife and I back to South Africa. Is there something you feel like you should be doing that you haven't done yet? What if time and money were no object? What would you be doing? Imagine yourself doing that thing. How do you feel? Are you smiling? Well, hold on to that thought because I want to show you how that one question could spark a tidal wave of inspiration. And this is how it works. Plants produce fruit, which have seeds, and those seeds go back in the ground and produce more plants. This is Propagation 101. So imagine yourself doing the thing that you've been putting off, and maybe you inspire a couple people to go do the thing that they've been putting off. And then they go inspire others, and pretty soon you have a chain reaction of what I'm calling exponential inspiration. And it works like this. In the first year, you inspire two people to go cultivate their gift. And then the next year, those two people inspire two people each. And that continues on until in 33 years, the entire world population will be inspired <laughs> to cultivate their gift. <laughs> now, it starts off slow, to be honest. You can see that curve goes on long, it looks like zero for a really long time until it gets up. In the first three years, you'll inspire eight people. It's about the size of your family. And then in 10 years, you'll have inspired 1,000 people, which is not bad. Then 23 years later, which is a decent amount of time, but not that long, you've inspired 8 million people, which is the entire population of New York City. And then in just a generation, 7.5 billion people will be cultivating their gift. Can you imagine the fruit that that would produce? It's crazy, right? But we can see how this happens. You know, I've had the privilege of working with some people who do some amazing things, things that we look up to. But they all have something in common. They started with something small, just a small idea. And they followed it to wherever it led them. You know, when my grandpa was taking me along gardening, he didn't know that he was going to inspire me to get up and share this with you all. When Robin Richter decided to make peanut butter sandwiches for the kids down the street, she had no idea that it would inspire me to pursue my gift. So today, I'm here to pass that inspiration on to you. Are you going to pick it up? The first step is deciding that you have a gift that's worth cultivating. And then just tell somebody about it and get started. Before long, you'll have so much joy, it'll be so much fun, it won't even feel like work. You know, when I look out at you, I see so much potential, so much fruit that's begging to be harvested, waiting for you, your life's gardener, to cultivate it. So start preparing your soil for something good to grow. Slow down, give yourself time. And then protect those things as they grow up from negative thoughts and feed them only good things. And then you'll have fruit to share with the world. and You'll be propagating and sharing it, inspiring others. Because I believe with my whole heart that what the world really needs is you cultivating your gift. Thank you.